Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see this uh, this crowd. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, just like that, we're in Advent, a time of preparation for the Christmas season. Sometimes this preparation can create undue pressure for us. We hear the music. We know the Christmas specials are on. We see the scores and scores of commercials. And we spend many hours in the stores looking for that perfect gift. The question I ask is, is this really what Christmas is about? It's part of it, but there's more. We have as our special guest tonight, Father Louis Klein, a hospital chaplain for Sisters Hospital on Main Street, but more so on St. Joseph campus in Chictawaga. Two reasons we invited Father Lou to join us tonight is because of his humor and his unique experiences ministering to families in need. These experiences shed light on what is really important in our lives. And if we can tap into these deeper meanings in life, then perhaps Christmas will have a deeper meaning for us too. Jesus is the reason for the season. We're glad that you're with us tonight, and we wish you tidings of comfort and joy. Please join me in welcoming Father Louis Klein. We'll begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God's choicest blessings come upon each and every one of you as you prepare for the coming of the birth of our Savior, Jesus. We pray that any crosses that you might have in your own personal lives, that God will ease them and strengthen you and help you to accept those crosses as best as possible. As we prepare for the coming of the birth of our Savior, Jesus, we know that Advent is a preparation for Christmas. We know Lent is preparation for Easter. And we know that we are called to prepare our hearts in a loving way for the birth of our Savior, Jesus. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I, I just want to start by just giving you a thought, an opening image thought to reflect on during Advent. How will you fill your jar? A philosophy professor stood before his class and had some items in front of him. When class began, wordlessly he picked up a large empty mayonnaise jar and proceeded to fill it with rocks right to the top, rocks about two inches in diameter. He then asked the students if the jar was full. They all agreed it was. So the professor picked up a box of pebbles and poured them into the jar. He shook the jar lightly. The pebbles, of course, rolled into the open areas between the rocks. The students laughed. He asked the students again if the jar was full. They agreed that yes, it was full. The professor then picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. Of course, the sand filled up everything else. He then asked the students if the jar was full. They agreed that it was. He proceeded to, proceeded to pour a cup of wine into the jar and shook it as the wine slipped between all the sand. Now, said the professor, I want you to recognize that this is your life. The rocks are the important things. Your family, your partner, your health, your children, anything that is so important to you that if it were lost, you would be nearly destroyed. The pebbles are the other things in life that matter, but on a smaller scale. The pebbles represent things like your job, your house, your car. The sand is everything else, the small stuff in our lives. If you put the sand or the pebbles into the jar first, there's no room for the rocks. The same goes for your life. If you spend all your energy and time on the small stuff, material things, you will never have room for the things that are truly most important. Pay attention to the things that are critical in your life. 
Play with your children. Take your partner out dancing. There will always be time to go to work, clean the house, give a dinner party, and fix the disposal. Take care of the rocks first, the things that really matter. Set your priorities. The rest is just pebbles and sand. Remember, there is always room for wine. That's just something you can think about, you know, during this Advent season, what's important in your life and what to place first. I know I just want to share with you, I've come to Gregory the Great for many years. Many years I've come here for, uh, and I know there's churches other in your family of families here, so, you know, we want you to feel most welcome. But most of the time I was here at least 10 times a year in Lent and in Easter, uh, in Lent and in Advent for confessions. I'd always be in the crying room. Because as a hospital chaplain, I had a pager. So if I got paged, I didn't want to be up on the front altar and everything. So I'd be in the crying room. And Father Leon would introduce me. He goes, Father Lou's in the crying room. And he'll make sure you cry. And then so no kids want to come to me. But I always remember that one time I was in one of the confessionals. Because somebody else beat me to the crying room. And so what happened was a little kid came to confession. And he's on the other side. And there's a kneeler there that sets off a light. And so what happened was, you know, I said, relax, know that God loves you and tell me what you're sorry for. The little boy said, you know, I'm sorry, you know, that I ate two cookies, you know, for before my meal. I snuck them out. At that time when he said that, the light went out. He thought I controlled the light. He goes, hey, what are you doing? I go, are you sitting? He goes, yeah. I said, did you have your foot on that kneeler? He goes, well, yeah. I go, did you just take your foot off that kneeler? He goes, oh, yeah, that's why the light went off. I said, put your foot back on that kneeler, and the light went back on. He goes, this guy's nuts. This priest's got to be nuts. If I just took two cookies, I'm not telling him anything else. And I can remember over the years, like even at my parish at Queen of Martyrs, kids would come to me and they go, well, you know, Father, I disobeyed my mother. I go, I know your mother. I wouldn't listen to her either. No, I didn't do that. All right, you <laughs> know. I'd be down to the bishop again. No, I'm not kidding. But what happens is, life's too short. Life's too short. It's, the other side, it's, this ain't about me, but I just want to share with you, on April 4th of this past year, for 10 years, 12 years, I've been pre-diabetic. On April 4th, I was diagnosed being full-blown diabetic. And so the doctor was ready to call, you know, the pharmacy, and, you know, and he said, you know, I just want you to know that uh, you got to take some medicine and all this. I said, Doc, hang up that phone. I said, I'm going to take care of this. So I, as a chaplain at St. Joe's Hospital, it's my primary responsibility. I, I went to see Joan Penapinto. She's a nutritionist. So I asked Joan, I said, what am I supposed to do? You know, what do you eat to be proper, you know, to turn this around? So she told me all the things that go to sugar and everything, like corn on the cob goes to sugar. I didn't know all this stuff and all these things. So then she, she told me. I said, so for 90 days, I went cold turkey, gave up everything that was going to cause go to sugar and everything. So on July 5th, this past year, I had my blood drawn again. July 11th, I got the results. When 90 days, I lost 53 pounds just eating rabbit food, reversed the A1C, and then in the next three months, I lost another 11 pounds and everything. But not everybody can do that. So I'm not saying it because some people are juvenile diabetic right from the get-go. And so, you know, you can't control that. And so what happened was, you know, I ended up telling the people at Queen of Mars, when you lose weight, 53 pounds in that short period of time, people think you're dying of cancer. You know, and so like even, we had Mike Sullivan who died through the Buffalo Buildings and Grounds. Unfortunately, Mike went to heaven. He died of cancer and he lost weight really fast. So I, I told the people, no, I'm just trying to do this on purpose. But what happened was, when I lost that 53 pounds in 90 days, I told everybody, if that didn't work, I was going to go order a wedding cake and two sheet pizzas and eat myself to death. <laughs> and then I also got new glasses, and so they make me look more studious and intelligent until I start talking. Everybody says, it's not intelligent anymore. And so most people haven't recognized me. Like even when you walk in here, and even at the hospital at Sisters on Main Street, a lot of them would say, who is that? Who is that? And then a lot of the nurses would say, well, you look good, you look good. I go, nothing wrong with your eyesight. No. <laughs> hey, I'm Mr. Humble. But what, what happens is we know as we journey through this world, 
St. Francis of Assisi was the troubadour of Christ. He was the troubadour of Christ and very joyful. And joyful, and that's what, you know, when we look forward to the coming of the Savior, what kind of Savior are we looking to come into our lives? The Savior that we come and look into our lives is the one that loves you very, very much. It's like a lot of times your image of God is so important in your life. Like a lot of times people have a, a, a poor image of God. They think of God as a, a judge up in the sky. Good deeds and bad deeds. Let's see what this person did this week or that week. That's how God looks at us. God has a tremendous amount of mercy for each of us. God looks at us as someone who, like the prophet Isaiah says, can a mother forget her child, be without tenderness for the child of her womb, even if a mother should, I'll never forget you. I've carved your name on the palm of my hand. We used to have banners read in the back of church, you are precious in my eyes, you are honored and I love you. That's how God feels about you. That's the type of Savior that's going to come into our lives. Not one who's, going to, like, who's, who's angry at you, who's upset with you. And a lot of times we always get think in our lives that God's going to punish us for something. That's not how God works. God is love. God is love. And so even though we have hurts in our lives, even though we have tremendous amount of pain, I can remember, you know, if you go back to, not you go back, but I go back to September 12th, 1962, I was 11 years old, my sister's 13, my mother's 41, my dad's 49, he goes to work, drops out of a major heart attack at work. And so he never came home. He died around 2.30 in the afternoon, and so we didn't find out until about 5 o'clock at night, just before cell phones, texting, and all this other stuff. And so what's important is that we realize that God is not looking to punish any one of us. Pain and suffering do come into our lives, and, and it, it's just part of life, an unfortunate part of life. But, as I said, the prophet Isaiah says, you are precious in my eyes, you are honored, and I love you. Each and every one of you are precious in God's eyes. We're precious human beings from the moment we're conceived in our mom's womb, and, so, and we're honored. That is, we're made in the image and likeness of God, and that Jesus loves us in that, in that precious way. And so, as we look, we have to, not have to, but it's important to realize your family members over the years have been examples of faith to you. That's what makes you come to church. That's what makes you, you know, come and, and receive God's graces. Our family members have been the ones who have taught us, have taught us, like, say, for example, I always like to... At Queen of Mars, when we used to have the daily mass, I would always read, like say, the family record of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and how that human history, that human history of Jesus, you know, became man, you know, to us, because he wanted a divine person to help us in our daily lives. Well, the people that have been in your life, your grandparents, sometimes your older brothers and sisters, your siblings or your grandchildren, they're, all of them, your mom or dad, have helped bring you to this place in your life where faith is important to you. Faith is important to you. And so I would always, Jesse, the father of King David, then I'd read Jehoshaphat, the father of Joham, Joham, the father of Uzariah, Uzariah, the father of Jotham. And we had seven nuns at Mass, seven nuns at Queen of Mars. And then I'd go, okay, who is the father of Zehubabal. And they go, well, I don't know, I don't know. I go, all right, I'll read this gospel again. So now, when the sisters got iPhones about four or five years ago, they had on their iPhones. They go, we got it right here, Father. So they shut me up. But the point is that we're all part of a human family and our, our parents, our grandparents, and all of those before us have brought us to this point. You know, it's the same way, you know, like Father Leon, you've you got one sister, right? I remember, like, when I stopped at the wake for, I believe, for your dad, and, and I, I said that, that at least, you know, there was, uh, you know, one child your father was happy to bring in the world, your sister. No, <laughs> that's my humor. He's a great priest, you know what I mean? And I, in fact, I, I said to somebody at the hospital today that there's never been a microphone I didn't like. That's a quote from Father Leon, no. <laughs> But what happens is Jesus loves you tremendously. 
and, and he loves you tremendously. And, and I, I did want to share with you some things that you know, like happened at the hospital over the, over the years, especially during COVID. During COVID, we became a hospital where Rebecca McCormick Boyle, she was a two-star admiral in the Navy. She ran the hospital where uh, we had the red area, the green area, and the yellow area, and it was you know, highly contagious and everything, and we were the only hospital in the whole uh, you know, state, not just the state, but in the whole country that became COVID, you know, just taking care of COVID people. And so that was a very you know, special time in people's lives. And like Father John Gaglione, you know, he was like a, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He was part of management. I wasn't part of any of that higher up management and everything, but I was part of, you know, the hospital at St. Joe's, like being the oldest chaplain there from 1999 to the present. And so then, you know, Rebecca McCormick Boyle had me like a lot of times uh, at night. Every night at 7 o'clock at night, we had a prayer seven days a week without exception we celebrate a prayer overhead, you know, throughout the whole hospital. And it was something to, like, uh, inspire the, the, the staff and to let them know. It, it wasn't just all prayer for, it was like jokes, it was just trying to think, because everything was so stressful. Everything was so stressful. People didn't know if they're going to live or die, you know. And so, and even the staff, like, one of the hardest things for the staff was you, you had, like, emergency room nurses... And you had operating room nurses, and you had floor nurses, and in 48 hours, they had to be trained to be ICU nurses. And normally that would be, you'd take about two to three months. So that was highly stressful for all those nurses. So this isn't about me, but it's about me trying to tell the story about how, you know, uh, the people were the true heroes, the true heroes, and it was always all hands on deck. I remember when Admiral Rebecca McCormick Boyle, I mean, we got along fine and everything, and so after she was there about, you know, two weeks or three, it was April 1st, and I went up to her, and I go, Rebecca, you look stunning. There's a glow about you. You look, you know, fabulous. She goes, well, thanks, Father. I go, April fool. <laughs> so, you know, I told everybody, she's going to have me walk the plank and everything. They go, she's not a pirate, she's an admiral. You know what I mean? And so, but she was smart in the sense, a tremendously devout Catholic lady, the tremendously devout, she was, like, if she was in the army, she'd be a two-star general. And so, you know, like, it was part of Catholic health, she was on that staff, and, and she always said, all hands on deck, and we're always, you know, together, you know, trying to look out for each other. And I just want to share with you, but one of the things, too, was we had, never give up. Never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. And that was, you know, the, the mantra that we had for not just for the staff but also for you know the patients and and it was like uh, it was a tough time and in fact I had you know they had nuns of anarchy in California they had a picture here of a nun drinking and everything and so just, I just asked her I said you know could I you know put this out and say was this your first calling were you really called to be a nun she was a married lady a widow and everything and so and then her second calling, go Navy. When you see Father Lou, let him know your verbal vote. Is the Admiral's first calling to be a nun, fact or fiction, with a smile? So she gave me permission to do this. It got the whole hospital laughing and being happy and everything. And she thought I was just going to put out maybe two or three of these flyers. The next day there were 200 of them all throughout the hospital and people were voting, you know, seriously in that. But there was a term in the Navy, they said a multiplier. They called it a multiplier if you... You know, like say, for example, try to do something consistently, consistently, you, you're trying to like uplift the spirits of the people. And that's why, you know, for like seven days a week at 7 p.m., you know, rain or shine, there would be like a, a prayer overhead. And it was something to just help the staff know that, you know, Jesus is with them. We were reading things from kids. Kids were sending in from, you know, different schools and parishes and everything. Uh, things that we, we love you, we care for you, to all the nurses, the doctors and everything. And so it was inspiring. And, and so what happened too is like, here's one of the, on April 15, 2020, somebody who left the hospital wrote, I have no idea of how, where, or from whom I contracted COVID-19, but it happened. I spent 10 days at home 
Then another 10 days in two different hospitals. St. Mary's in Lewiston and St. Joe's in Chictawaga. I have nothing but the utmost respect and admiration for the staff at both locations. I wish I would remember all the names of my nurses, doctors, aides, etc., so I could thank them personally. I know these folks are used to dealing with all kinds of injuries, diseases, viruses, but this is different. I can only imagine the additional fortitude it takes to help and comfort people and perform your normal duties while wearing multiple layers of garments, masks, face shields, hats, and double gloves. All the while knowing that a simple error or a mix-up could result in the caregiver being infected. All of you truly are heroes in my mind, especially the nurses. This person writes, my mother's an RN, a registered nurse, thus a slight bias toward the nurses. At St. Joe's, whenever a patient was discharged, they would play music that all patients could hear and knew there was another person headed home. Headed home, home, not home to heaven. It's like when I go see somebody in the room in the hospital, they go, you know, after surgery or something now, I go, you're going home? They go, yeah, I'm going home. I go, home, home, or home to heaven? They go, no, no, home, home. So at St. Joe's, whenever a patient was discharged, they would play music that all patients could hear and knew that there was another person headed home. The staff would also clap and cheer. It gave me consolation, solace, hope, and joy every time the music would be played. I would also like to thank Pastor Lou from St. Joe's, who took the time and personally called my wife, some other family members, and myself. Turns out Pastor Lou is a big Bills fan, He told me a story of his experience of being at the Bills Super Bowl in Pasadena, California. As life would have it, I was also at that same Super Bowl. Well, there's always next year. We all know that right now with the Kansas City Chiefs coming to town and everything. As I sit in my room, overlooking the lower Niagara River, seeing the birds flying around, hearing my wife playing with the dogs outside, and all the other mundane sights and sounds that we all tend to take for granted, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of those who are directly or indirectly caring for those of us that were unfortunate enough to contract this disease. P.S. Don't Stop Believing, and the person signed his name. And that was the, you know, the song they would play, Don't Stop Believing and everything. And it was like a a very tough time, but there was a humanity to each and every one of us, you know. Like, say, for example, the story that I told them was when I was at Pasadena, it was in 1992, the Bills lost the Cowboys 52-17. to 17. And so after the game was over, you know, the buses would take you back to the cars. You couldn't walk to your car, the buses would have to take you back. You're still out there with those Cowboy fans, and I had my Bill Zuba pants on. I didn't go in a collar, but what happened was there was a girl next to me, about 30 years old, looked like an, ex-cowgirl, looked like an ex-cowgirl cheerleader. She had a diamond necklace around her neck, two-inch diamond earrings on her ears, young after the game. How about them cowboys? How about them cowboys? So I told him finally after about two, three minutes that I couldn't take it anymore. So I looked at her and go, hey, ma'am, at least in Buffalo, we don't live on farms. Well, without banging an eye, she fired back, sir, I beg your pardon, in Texas, we call them ranches. So you know what I did? I looked at her husband and said, nice of you to bring your mother to the Super Bowl. Then I said, I'm a priest from Buffalo, please forgive me. I mean, they didn't care, but you know what I mean? You got to have a sense of humor. This is how you get through, you know, the pain, the struggles. You know, it's not going to stop something from happening, but like St. Francis of Assisi, you know, God gave us that, that humor, that laughter, and there's one thing that you can't do while you're laughing. You can't cry. You can't cry when you're laughing. If you can bring some joy to people in that, it's so important in, in their lives and in our lives. Like even one of the things, too, is that at St. Joe's Hospital, we have like a deacon, John Zielinski, he's, you know, battling some, you know, uh, uh, disease like cancer, and he's he's getting better at all this other stuff, but, you know, we're all shorthanded at different places. So like right now, like four days a week, I'm up at 4.10 in the morning to get to St. Joe's Hospital to see people having surgeries from like 5.30 in the morning all the way to you know, like 1.30 in the afternoon, sometimes a little later. And so what will happen is, you know, if they 
If they're Catholic, I'll say one prayer. If they're not Catholic, I'll say another prayer, the equivalent to anoint the other sick. And at the end, of, and like this morning, we had like seven people in it between 5.30 and 5.35. And so they all come in real fast and everything. So we get them you know, lined up and everything. And then you, you make certain there's like five different surgeons. So I've got to make a big announcement. You're not all here for the same surgeon or else we'd have a riot. Why are we all coming here at the same time? And if they're Catholic, I'll say one prayer, non-Catholic, another prayer. And at the end of that, I'll say, thank you for accepting that prayer. Administration gives me a five-cent commission for every prayer I say. I'm joking about that, but what happens is most people know, but we had a Catholic guy, 85 years old, came in a few months ago. He took me seriously. He goes, Father, I got a big bag of bottles and cans in a car. I'll bring them in. You go redeem them. I go, pal, things aren't that bad. <laughs> but what happens is it's a sense of people are stressed out. People are stressed out, you know, before surgery. And so, you know, they, they're appreciative. They're appreciative of, you know, like say, uh, to be able to laugh, to be able to smile. Then they'll also, you know, say things about what's going on in their lives, not just about their loved one having surgery, but they're concerned about, they're in a sandwich community, you know, sandwich generation, not community, where they're not just taking care of their loved one. They got a, a loved one at home or they got a parent that they're taking care of, then they got kids they're taking care of and everything. Or sometimes, you know, one lady will go, oh, geez, Father, i got to go back home right away. I'll come back later to see my husband, but i got to take the dogs out. I go, the dog's more important than your husband. She goes, you got that right. <laughs> and you know how we love our pets. You know, like say, for example, I will share as another side, like i got a little dog, Oscar. He's a Maltese. He's like... Uh, full-grown, eight pounds and everything. But before that, we had Tiger. We had Tiger who lived in Kenmore, you know, where my sister lives, and I'm part owner of the dog. You know, not just, uh, you know, myself, but the next-door neighbor, Josie, and her husband, and and my sister, Helen, were all part owners of the dog. Well, when Tiger was one year old, some about 17 years ago, I'm walking through a park, and a lady's pushing a stroller, and she sees Tiger, and she goes, what kind of dog is that? For I could say it's a purebred Maltese, eight pounds full-grown. She goes... Is that a llama apsu or a lhasa apsu? I go, no. And she's insulting my dog, calling it a different breed. I'm ready to look in a stroller. Is that a bulldog? But I did it. <laughs> I didn't have my collar on, you know what I mean? But what happens is you have to, not you have to, but God gave us, you know, each other to look out for each other. To look out for each other and to help each other along the way. Like I know one lady was saying, how, uh, I remember when I first started at St. Joe's Hospital. I started in 1995 at Sisters Hospital. And then in 99, one of the priests left, you know, and so I, I replaced him. And so we had a fundraiser for Donna Mum. Donna Mum at the, at the, I forget, downtown. I forget the name of the place. There was like a, a thousand people there. And we had a thousand people there. And, and so everybody, you know, was uh, gathered together and everything. And there was like 10 nurses from the fourth floor. So I went up to them and I go to one of them. I go, you look fairly attractive tonight. And the girl goes, well, thank you, Father Lou. And I knew the other person. This was Celeste. Celeste is now a big manager and everything. Celeste goes, what about me, Father? What about me? I go, Celeste, the lights aren't that dim. So I know. If I get sick, I've got to go to Kaleida. Because they, they're going to remember my smart mouth at you know, St. Joe's Hospital, Sisters Hospital. But what happens is, as we journey through this world, we have to realize too that our prayer this past Advent for the solemn blessing it spoke about may almighty and merciful God by his grace you have, you have placed your faith in the first coming of his only begotten son and yearn for his coming again. Sanctify you by the radiance of Christ's Advent and enrich you with his blessings. But the second part of that solemn blessing was as you run the race of this present life you don't have to run the race. You can just, you know, walk through and stroll through. As you run the race of this present life, may, you, may God make you firm in faith. And that comes from uh, the people who have brought us to this point in our lives. Sisters, religious, lay people. And may you be joyful in hope. Joyful in hope and active in charity. And that's so important, you know, to be loving and caring. I know... The most important thing, not the most important thing, but you know, I had a funeral recently for one of my prisoners who was 99 years old and he was a, uh, a prisoner of war. He was a prisoner of war. I saw him at Veterans Hospital about a couple weeks ago before and everything. And he said you know, that the only thing that got him through 
during World War II as a prisoner of war was his faith. His faith in Jesus. His hope in Jesus. His knowing that God loved him. And then he even taught, because I knew him, I knew his family and everything for quite a few years and everything. I went to college with his son-in-law and at the University of Buffalo. And, you know, he said, you know, like, he was trying to say to me that my vocation as a priest was more important than his. And I stopped him there. I said, that's not true. That's not true. You know, that you as a person who, brought, you know, was faithful to your wife and she died about six years ago and everything and, and, and also uh, through thick and thin and then bringing in the kids into the world and the grandkids and, and the great-grandkids and everything. And all those sacrifices, all these sacrifices he made. So that's important for you to realize that. You to realize that, you know, whether you're religious or you're a, a priest, a cleric, or, or a lay person, you have a special charism. You have a special charism. And so anything you do, you know, that's other-centered, Christ-centered for other people, that is something that God has blessed you with. And that builds up the body of Christ. And that's why, like, you know, through the last few years and everything, daily prayer, weekly worship, receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, this is the only place, like, say, COVID threw us all in, in, in upside down. The world became upside down because everybody got used to, you know, sometimes, you know, listening on TV, watching. I remember, I think it was Cardinal, I forget the one Cardinal, he said even his mother was watching on TV, you know, and she said, you know, hey, I take a break, have a Bloody Mary, go back to the TV. But, you know, the most important thing is coming around the table of the Lord come around the table of the Lord to receive Jesus. And, and that's so important in our lives. And you can't get that anyplace else. And so as we continue to you know, journey through this world, we have to realize, too, that one of the other things I want to share with you is we have to trust God. We know that he, that he loved and loves us so much and that he sent us his only begotten son. Jesus, our Savior, will become into the world that we might have eternal life. Let us think about it in this way. God is crazy about you. If he had a wallet, your photo of you would be in it. If he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. When you want to talk to him, he's there and he'll listen. He can live anywhere in the universe Yet he chose to live in your heart. And that's so important in our lives that we continue to share that love with one another. I want to share with you another story here. It was entitled, Jesus said to the twelve, Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. And sometimes, you know, we can, in our lives, make quick judgments and everything. So this was a video showed a man rushing to Starbucks for his morning coffee. Backing out of his driveway, he hits his brakes as a kid on a skateboard is taking his sweet time to motor past his driveway. Following that big bit of aggravation, he drives to his destination only to have a car cut him off and then commandeer the parking spot he had intended to occupy. Once inside Starbucks, he becomes further annoyed as a customer cuts in line and then, when he reaches the counter, he encounters a young barista who can't seem to get his order straight. Annoyed, upset, and aggravated, he takes his coffee to his favorite seat to stew in his misery. A man stops by and hands him a pair of glasses. Dining those glasses, he discovers that when he looks at someone a written line comes across that picture informing him of what's going on in that person's life. He looks at the person that stole his parking space and the line read, just buried her husband yesterday. When he looks at the customer who cut in line, the caption read, just diagnosed with cancer. Looking over to the barista behind the counter, the line read, he gets bullied every day. When he got home and spotted the kid on the skateboard, the caption read, he is in his fourth foster home. Needless to say, 
what had been hidden and now revealed provided the man with a whole different attitude. Loving God, help you and I to realize that that which is concealed when it comes to the lives of others, help us to understand that their behavior may well be fueled by a hurt or wound too painful to reveal. Forgive us, Lord, if we've made if we've been mad at someone whom we should have comforted them. And so what happens too is that Jesus, the, the good shepherd, you know, comes for each and every one of us and he like, wants to rescue us. I remember, I think it was Father Leon, uh, there's always a picture of Jesus, the good shepherd, carrying that lamb on his, you know, in search of that lost stray. But I, I think there was a, a picture here, Father Leon once was preaching about it, where there's Jesus, the good shepherd, leaning over like a, a, a hill. I think that was it. And it's like he's risking his life. Jesus is risking his life for us. It's not just like sometimes we see these warm and fuzzy you know, stories of the good shepherd carrying the little lamb on his shoulders, but Jesus leaning over that hill and trying to rescue that sheep who's, who's gone astray and everything. And so in our lives too, we have to realize too that God has counted every hair on our heads. He's counted every hair on our head and he, you know, he knows that neither, you know, no bird, no falls from the sky without God knowing about it. And so many times in our lives too, you know, the Jesus who comes, you know, at Christmas time knows that there's a lot of murkiness in our lives, but he also knows sometimes we jump to conclusions. I'll give you a story about jumping conclusions. My first assignment was St. James in Jamestown, and there was a funeral that we had for uh, this one, you know, man who passed away. And so I remember telling Tom Campana, that the, the sister-in-law, the sister-in-law of this gentleman who passed away was really, really crying so much. It was just like, almost like she lost her husband or something. Like, it, it was just, it just seemed to me like way over the top. And I said, you know, I'm just wondering what that's all about. And he said to me, he goes, well, what happened was her and her husband lived downstairs. And the guy who died, her brother-in-law, that's the husband, his brother, lived upstairs. And so what happened was he passed away and she was just crying so much. And now what comes to mind in somebody's life, you know, when you think about she was overwhelmed with tears so much, what do you think was going on? Just take a quick guess. They were seeing each other, right. I mean, that's, that's what, if I told them, maybe if I was a little more or less tired, I could tell a little more, but people would think, well, they had, you know, an affair. They had an affair. You know, that's the first thing that comes to your mind and things like that. But what it was, was it wasn't an affair. It was her husband beat her. And there was domestic violence in the house. And every time he heard her crying, he'd come down and protect her. And that's what that was all about. You know, so she lost her protector. That's why, you know, so I just share that, you know, not to, you know, to trap you or things like that, but to know sometimes we don't know what's going on, you know, in people's lives and, and we come to those, you know, quick judgments on that. And so, you know, when you know, we come to the cross, we bring to Jesus on the cross all the things that bother us, like say worry, we bring worry, like that can like overwhelm us. My own mother, I remember when my father died, like I said, when I was only 11, my sister's 13, my mother's 41, she worried. And, and so many things like in her life that she worried about, but like say Winston Churchill said during, when, you know, during World War II, there was many things he worried about. He worried about, you know, like say uh, that England would be invaded, the Allied troops wouldn't help out. He worried about, but he said 99% of those things he worried about didn't come true. And so the same way like in our lives, Jesus, the counselor, the wonder maker, the, the good shepherd, you know, the, the one who loves you so tremendously and personally, he's the one who, you know, uh, wants you to say, live one day at a time. One day at a time. Because we can worry about so many things. Like even a couple weeks ago, I had to go see my uh, retina specialist. I was worried about not even being able to come here because like in 2014, I had retina surgery, face down therapy. When I saw the eye doctor about, uh, what was it, about four, three months ago, she said, you got to see your retina specialist. And now this eye it was acting up, and I was worried I might have to have face-down therapy again. In fact, I went to, you know, when I had that, I went to the priest's retirement home, 
in uh, Monsignor Kniff residence. And I remember there was like Father Emil Switek, uh, Father Monsignor Jerry Sullivan, who's deceased now, Father Louis Dominic. I had to get four drops a day, four times a day, and those priests would put it in. And then I remember, you know, I was thinking to myself a few weeks ago, and so I finally got that result, you know, last week and everything. If I had to do that again, you know, who, where am I going to go? How are you going to do all this stuff? I remember telling those guys in 2014, I said, you know what? I think someday when I retire, I'm going to come live here with you guys. And then one of them said, I hope I'm dead by then. <laughs> I won't say who. But the other thing, too, when I knew there was a problem with that eye, now it's just uh, in 2014, this right, right eye. And then I ended up like telling all the women in the parish, they all look 10 pounds lighter. They all look 10 pounds lighter. So I remember in 2014, at Queen of Mars, all the women said, don't get the surgery. Just live with that, you know, and that. But the good news is that I appreciate your prayers and everybody's prayers that, you know, that, that left eye is intact and it's just like a uh, change in prescription and things like that. So that's important. The other thing is that uh, I'll just share with you a couple more stories. Just to, to let you know, the beeper went off. I got five more minutes to go, something like that. But back in 1975, I was 24 and a half years old thought about being a priest, graduating the University of Buffalo in an accounting degree. I worked three years as accountant and auditor. So in 1975, I went to Wildham's Hall, Augsburg, New York. It's a true story. First day in the seminary, they told me you got a lousy singing voice. So they said, you need voice lessons. So they had on staff this nun, Sister Nancy. She was 30 years old. So they said, go to the chapel every Thursday from 11 to 11.15 for individual voice lessons. I hated the lessons. The chapel was about a quarter of this size here, just me and the nun every Thursday from 11 to 11, 15. I'm there the fourth week. I'm singing out of the church hymnal. There's a whole note over the word me. I thought it was a quarter note, so I sang me real quick. I held for one beat. She held for four. This nun screams at me. She goes, hold me, hold me. So I did. I hugged the nun. I got in so much trouble. She stormed out of the chapel. She wouldn't teach me anymore. The next day I get called to the rector's office, Father Peter Riani, noon on a Friday. A seminarian knocks on my door. He goes, the rector wants to see you. I go, that's it. They're going to boot me out for being a wise guy. So then I get to his office. And I knock on the door. Hi, Father, I'm here. He goes, do you know why you're here? I acted dumb. No, not really. He goes, well, you can't hug the nun like that. I go, well, she was yelling, hold me, hold me. He goes, you know, she meant the note. I go, it was debatable. So I have five more years of schooling, so I said I better, better cool it. The other thing is that at St. Joe's Hospital, what happens is when I go to the emergency room, many times I'll you know, see people in the emergency room, like if uh, people are married, I'll go, how are you related? And they go husband and wife. And so the guy's in the bed, and you know, in the bed, and the lady, this is about a couple months ago. And so what happened was I go, he goes, we're married 42 years. They so look at the guy in the bed. Out of 42 years of marriage, buddy, how many happy? But a guy broke under pressure. He goes, maybe the first two. The wife jumped up, made a fist. You think you're sick now? Wait till I get you home. I go, buddy, you're Catholic. Lie in front of your wife. I'll forgive you in confession. Just lie. The other thing is that it's always a whole new audience. And so only with the women between ages of 20 and 95 in the emergency room, I'll ask them their age. I'll have in front of me a person, a woman's, Religion, whether Catholic, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Methodist, or whatever, and her age. And so anyone between ages of 20 and 95, not always, I'll go, ma'am, how old are you? The lady goes, father, I'm 68 years old. I go, lady, it says you're 90. You just lied to a priest. She goes, oh, sorry, father. And so one time I asked a woman her age. She goes, father, don't you know it's rude? It's impolite? It's poor manners? God gave me a quick wit. I came back with lady, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to insult you. I go, how much do you weigh? <laughs> and the lady goes, I'm 55 years old. I say, I work for the Pope. You're giving it up. You know what I mean? I didn't care about her weight and everything. But life is too short. God gave us you know, a sense of humor. And God gave us the greatest gift to prepare for. That's the birth of the baby Jesus. The birth of baby Jesus. And as I started with that story, what's the most important thing in your lives? What is important? You know, like, it's not always, you know, like, I'm glad there's no little kids here because, like, cleaning, I haven't made my bed in 40 years. You know what I mean? I just roll into it, roll out of it. But I don't say that because then parents go, I want that kid to make their bed. 
But what happens is what's important is to look out for each other, support each other, not to be quick to judge and, and to always, you know, like say, uh, place one day at a time. And the things we worry about, like say, I was really concerned about the fact that I might have to call and say, I got to have emergency surgery or something for that eye. Because I don't know if you remember Father Joe Baines. Remember Father Joe Baines, the Franciscan priest and everything? When I had surgery in 2014 in August, August 1st, Father Joe Baines went to the hospital, or went to have the same retina specialist. He went to see him the day before, on July 31st. And he had to have emergency surgery for, you know, retina because of the fact that, you know, you could lose sight in that eye. And so, you know, there's many things that we always pray for. We pray for each other. There's many things like in your life that you, you anticipate, you, 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 you worry, we worry. But the power of prayer is so important. The power of prayer is so important in our lives, <coughs> in our trust in Jesus and in the Eucharist to strengthen us to live one day at a time until someday we come around the table of the Lord you know, and then, you know, we'll all there be there. And then everything will be answered. We won't know, you know, until that time. Nobody knows the reason for some of the suffering or why this happens to this person or that person. But we do know that God is in charge. He permits suffering in this world. He's not happy about it. It's just part of, you know, like nature. Part of nature sometimes and, and part of, you know, uh, inhumanity to inhumanity. Man to inhumanity to each other and stuff. And so we, we ask God to continue to bless you and in this Advent season prepare for the coming of the Savior. And the Savior that we look forward to is kind-hearted, is merciful, is someone who loves you more than you can ever, ever imagine. And so in Jesus' name, I love you. Have a blessed day. And God bless you. Thank you, Father. We appreciate the uh, inspiring words, humorous stories. Um, we'll wrap it up. I'll invite Father Leon if he'd like to say a few words to, to wrap it up and maybe close with prayer. I'm out of here. If it's a few words, that could be 9.30. Oh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> hey, I'm smarter than I look. <laughs> Nothing personal, Father Leon. <laughs> We thank you again for coming tonight. Um, if you uh, wanted to say a few words to Father Lou, I, I, I'm sure that he might stick around a little bit, but keeping in mind, right, he, he says that he's up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So Tomorrow it's the same thing. So, But uh, thank you again, and I turn it over to our pastor. I got the stun gun. <laughs> <laughs> They're all going to want one. <laughs> They're all going to want one. No, just uh, we already offered a, a round of applause, but to, to thank you again, Father Lou, for coming. I uh, told the people at the Masses I had to come because you are very entertaining, very funny. You are a man of great faith, and not to believe any stories about me that you tell. <laughs> and uh, your beautiful balance of, of humor, and then after a few stories boom, right into a beautiful point. And uh, it's really uh, a sign of a very active faith life and a beautiful life of ministry. And we thank you for taking the time to be here with us. And we thank you for your ministry. And we thank you for bringing us back to the very basic things that we forget about the Lord, the profound love that we can't even imagine, that gift of humor, the ability to look after one another all those very basic things that busyness of life can sometimes take away. We thank you for reminding us of that as we begin the, the Advent journey. We thank all of you for coming, and certainly uh, Brian Rue, uh, who brings all these kinds of things together for us, along with our adult faith formation team. And, and uh, certainly uh, we wish you all a wonderful Advent. It's going to be a quick one this year. Because the fourth Sunday, as you know, is... It's Christmas Eve, so uh, the fourth week of Advent is about four hours long, and, uh, and that's it. So hopefully this uh, kind of sets us all on a beautiful pace of things to reflect on as we uh, prepare to welcome the Lord and to recognize Him 
in the needs and service of one another. Thank you all for being here again. Thank you, Father Lou.